Please join me in welcoming the one, the only, I think, one of the, the truly uh, pioneering American artists of the past century, Mr. Melvin Van People. You know, if Mario was here, he would say, you see what I had to grow up with. <laughs> um, when Mario decided to do the movie, he came to me and asked me, he said, Dad, I want to um, take your book which, um, about the making of Sweetback and make a movie out of it. And um, I said, okay, son, as long as you pay me. <laughs> so um, he paid me. And that was my, my real involvement with the movie. Except I said, um, don't make me too nice. And why I said that is because Mario had gone to a couple of the theaters, uh, I mean, a couple of the um, studios at the beginning, trying to, um, to make a deal with his idea. And when he finished the script, he and Dennis Haggerty wrote the script, they said, well, it's okay, but why don't you make it more for a, a, a white audience? Um, since you, your father started uh, the independent cinema, you really got that rolling. Make it for the festival audience. And Mario didn't want to do that. And then the next studio said, why don't you make it more hip-hop, put in um, um, more booty call, etc. put in some sort of that joke. And he didn't want to do that. So what happens with an African-American filmmaker he is allowed to make films that are action or funny, but the whole middle spectrum, if they have complexity, sometimes you are allowed to make complex movies as an African-American filmmaker, but if you do, you have to make the characters white, normally. And Mario didn't want to do that, and... Um, so he made the movie he wanted to. I was very surprised when the movie um, got its first review and the people were talking about this obsessed, driven, tough father. I found him a rather nice guy, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> I found him a pussycat. Anyway, all I can say is I saw the movie for the first time in Toronto. I hadn't, i just come to the set one day because I gave Mario the same respect I would give anyone else that, that bought one of my books. Let them do what they want to do. And normally a, a writer feels that he's been betrayed or it's been um, slanted one way or the other. I was delighted with the movie. I thought that he made the cinematic translations from the page um, extraordinarily well. The plus he added the the overtones that I the B part of with the the father and son, which I couldn't be privy to the mind of a thirteen year old, and um, he added those extra touches to it. One of the things I liked about it was this, um, the use of the testimonials. That is where you got to um, just hear the characters talking in real time. Now everybody, of course, is, oh, great, I always knew it was going to be wonderful, all that. But this was in real time. And um, so at the end of the movie, uh, 600 people are on their feet and everything. And Mars says, what did you think, Dad? And I said, well... It's like sea biscuit on two feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's how the movie struck me. I mean, it's I, I didn't really calculate the odds of what I was going up against, and until he encapsulated it in this 108 minutes, I had probably never really thought about it a lot. Okay, that's all I have to say. Except now, I'll answer questions. <laughs> Was there any sense of deja vu for you when you watched the movie for the first time? Because 
it's the story of you, your life making sweet, sweet bets, with your son playing you, and another actor playing your son. Uh, what did it, was there a strange sense of kind of time rerunning itself in front of your eyes at all, or or did you feel separate from? It? Well, you know, as um, as an editor, I'm a chief editor, and I usually edit all my my films or other people's films. You have an occupational um, disease. You're able to separate yourself from what's going on. And when I saw the movie, I was just seeing a movie. It wasn't even me. It was only afterwards. So, so otherwise you couldn't judge it if you keep putting yourself. But afterwards, after I'd seen the movie, um, I realized that it was that it was me. You know, people said, did it bring back memories? Well, when you look down the barrel of a gun, you don't get memories back because you never forget it. <laughs> I, I mean, it was yesterday. I still wake up sometime after all these years and, oh, shit, she put the gun in with the real gun. That was real, you know. She, she put the gun in the prop box. Hmm? That actually happened. And... Um, so it's still very present with me, the whole experience. Now, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and and now so many people have talked about Sweet Sweet Facts um, as this defining moment um, in independent cinema. It was kind of the, the hand grenade that was lobbed into the, the lap of, of American culture at the time. Did anyone except yourself um, see that that was coming? Did they know while it was happening how incendiary and how important this film was going to be, or was it just we have to get to the end, um, you know, day to day and try and get this thing finished? Well, I, I must say probably no one had the, the vision of what it could do. Um, however, I had a crew that was immensely loyal, immensely helpful, gave me a hundred and twenty percent. The that if, if you ever see, for example, the one thing I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about Badass because the second part of Sweetback had never been seen, which I thought was a very important a aspect, and that was the unity of the crew and the diverse character of the crew. The if you ever see the, the photo of the crew, um, a couple of white guys had their faces blacked out. And that's because there were union members who believed in what I was trying to do. And they would have been disbarred if the union could have proven that they helped. And um, the crew was, was, was wonderful within... The, with the fact that a third of the a third of my crew had never seen a camera before, but I was determined that we were going to have women and all disenfranchised white latino Asian people that never got a shot and um so they were with me if they had the the overall no the truth of the matter is very simple. I own Sweetback 100%. I've got no partners. Now you say, oh, that, I was a financial wizard? No, I wasn't a financial wizard. Nobody would come in with me. <laughs> hmm? So that, <laughs> so you have the, the two aspects of it. I, I have no partners. And I, would, I begged for it. Did you stay in touch with any of the, the crew or the cast members over the years? Did you end up working with any of them later on? Well, I was pretty much blackballed after that movie. I had a three-picture deal with Columbia, which they tore up, and I haven't really been invited to the table since then. <laughs> so um, I had really nothing to offer. However... At Sundance, when they were shooting a documentary on me, the director of photography 
was Jose Garcia, who was one of the guys who had gotten put in jail that time. So all the members went on to join the unions, and Mario shot his movie independently also. He shot this independently because um, that was the only way he could be in control of the final product. And what happened was, um, however, I shot mine in 19 days. I shot Sweet Back, and he shot this film in 18 days. However, he had the, the advantage of technology and a union crew of Latinos, of, of Asians, of women, that you could do union now, but it didn't exist at the time. It's very difficult, you know, to think of anything outside of a historical context, and the historical context of the movie well, of, of Sweetback was, was quite different, but still a lot of things have not changed. One of the most amazing things about your career is that you've never repeated yourself. Whether it's you know from film to film, like Story of the Three Day Pass, your first feature, which is an amazing movie, or Don't Play as Cheap, um, the the early music that you did in the 1970s. Had you ever thought about doing a sequel to Sweet Sweetbacks? Had you ever thought about Sweetbacks' further adventures? Yes. <laughs> um, Sweetback is a trilogy, and I'm, of course I'm, I'm dying to shoot the other two parts. And um, but I'm not willing to make any any concessions to what the story should be. I could perhaps raise the money. However, one of the new barriers to independent filmmaking, of course, is distribution. And I could not, in good conscience, take the money unless I had a distribution deal. And now a distribution deal often comes with the caveat, just as if there's a studio, even if you put up the money, of what the film can and cannot contain. So, um, it's it's ready to go. I, however, when I got so I got blackball from c cinema, I went to theater and, and started uh, Minorities on Broadway. We'd been, of course, on the stage, but we hadn't been the owners anymore before that time. And um, so I'd done Broadway, and then I I did other stuff. When did you know that? you first wanted to become a filmmaker. How, how young were you? Oh, I never did. I know, well, I knew when Mario wanted to become a filmmaker because I was standing there watching him, you know, but um, for myself, uh, that's quite another thing. I, I never thought about being a filmmaker at all. I just didn't like what I was seeing in this movie, so I said, I don't like that. It didn't mirror any of the people that I knew what I was forced to look at. And this was my, my beef why feedback was rated an X because I wouldn't go to the Motion Picture Association because I thought they had lost their validity. If the, the mandate, the manifesto for the Motion Picture Association at that time is to protect young minds and then minorities have to watch Tarzan, and one of this and one of that and so forth and so on. I said, well, you guys don't have the right to tell me what to do. And um, so I had to take an, an X rating. Um, I just never thought about it. What I did think about, people often say, well, who were your, who did you admire? It was not who I admired, it was who I was disgusted with, <laughs> which is a little different. And who were some of the, who were some of the, 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 the people or the films that, really angered you? I did about every damn thing that had a black person in it. <laughs> I remember once I, got, I was on a plane. This is very interesting because uh, I was just a kid, and the guy was sitting next to me. He says, uh, they had just passed this, this um, um, the, the um, Brown versus so-and-so, the, the segregation. And he said, explain to me something, young man. He says, your people have always had a bit of the 
the sun. You've always had a place in the sun in America. I said, yeah, but we want some of the shade. Forget it with the sun. I want, and I wanted to end. I, I got tired of seeing a movie where there was someone standing over the guy who's dead, the black guy who's dead. said, well, maybe one day America will be what it can be. In the meantime, you're dead. Uh, I, I didn't, want, didn't want that anymore. Uh, there's a very interesting thing that happened. And the first I'd, li- I'd like to say about badass, all the things you saw in there were true. The, the first two people who came into the cinema walked out and asked for their money back. And then the second screening was completely empty. And in the third screen, there were lines around the block. That is actually, that wasn't a cinematic telescoping of events. That is exactly the way it happened. Um, you just keep on keeping on. And, and after it premiered in Detroit, how did it spread across the country? Well, there are only two theaters, two theaters, not two cities <laughs> in the entire United States that would show it. Um, one was in Detroit and the other was in Atlanta, Georgia. And by the second day in Detroit, they were throwing popcorn and people were screaming and people would bring their lunches and sit to the movie three times. Also, black movies were not shown first run. They were always shown with a second feature. And I insisted that Sweetback be shown as a first run film. And um, so people could just sit through it. Anyway, I go to Atlanta, Georgia. It opened on Friday at Atlanta, Georgia. And this Atlanta had just been desegregated. Anyway, I walk in um, to the lobby, and I'm t- talking to the manager, and I'm saying, sir, don't worry. People are going to come. This is what's to happen in, um, in Detroit. And the guy, the word had already gotten out. He said, oh, the theater's full. But the, the, the black people were afraid to, to yell. And but the theater was full, except I found one seat next to an old black lady, and I sit down next to her. And it's toward the end of the movie when Sweetback is in the desert, and the lady says, "Oh Lord, let him die." <laughs> so she says, "Oh Lord," she kept praying over, "Let him die. Don't let them kill him." You see, we never live to the end of the movie, and it was absolutely beyond any thought that that someone could defy the authorities and live a white authority and live and so she, she just wanted him at least to die on his own that was the climate that that was pervasive when Sweetback made all this money Hollywood was um, preparing a a detective movie and they stopped the preparation and recast it black and that movie was Shaft. Shaft was really a white detective. And um, since I had no money to to advertise the movie besides most newspapers wouldn't run an X movie, wouldn't even run an ad for an X movie, um, I had to come up with something and I said, if I could write a hit tune, then that could be advertising, because I couldn't I couldn't pay for even a 15 second spot or a 30 second spot. So luckily, my secretary was sleeping with this guy, hmm, who turned I had this cockamamie band with this weird ass name. And I said, what's Earth, Wind, and Fire? You know? <laughs> and they they wrote the music that I had composed, and it was a hit tune. And so when the DJs played that, that was two minutes and 40 seconds of advertising. Now, it's ubiquitous. Every movie does that. But before that time, music was an afterthought. It was not used as a marketing, as a selling vehicle for, for a film. Now, half the movies you see are just sort of glorified video, you know. That's what happened. In, in this particular film, how much involvement I had? Or how, how similar was the, the struggle that Mario had to make Badass to the struggle that you went through to make Sweet Sweetbacks? Is that the, yeah. the question? Yeah. Right. 
Well, a number of things are quite similar. First, when he had a very restricted budget because he decided to do it itself with just independent financing, um, that that stopped being a 30 or 40 or whatever day shoot into an 18 day shoot that all that already was approaching the conditions that I had to deal with. Um, the the second thing, the reason he had not originally he says to me intended to play the role however at the the budgetary constraints the time constraints and he had to be sure that somebody would be there on time and who better didn't do it himself that's what he says and um, why I played the particular role in Sweetback was that I had not also had not intended to play the role however all the actors who had enough experience to handle such a large role also wanted to increase their lines. Everybody wanted me to add more lines. And because they had been taught the number of lines you have in a film equals your status in the film. I, I explained many times, well, he's in practically every scene, but he, I only say six phrases in the entire movie. Um, so those two considerations, the the time constraints and the the playing the personage uh, were the same. However, there were no there were no physical um, problems or 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 death threats. It seems nobody was ever took a shot at him or pointed a gun, um, which can can be a little, a little distracting. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, Sweetback eventually went everywhere. Um, the the man has an Achilles pocketbook, and once I broke the the box office record in this in Grand Circus, and then in Atlanta, everybody I became Mel Baby again. Everybody was calling, "Hey, Mel Baby, I hear you got this film, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So it played everywhere. After that, it ended up grossing about fifteen million dollars, and that was at a buck or a buck and a half a ticket. So it was the largest grossing independent film of 1971, and up to that time, it was the largest grossing independent film um, that had ever been made. And it was at that juncture that Hollywood be started to take independent films seriously. However, what happened was um, each city I went into, and it did this great box office, etc. People say, "Oh, that's a fluke. Oh, that's a fluke." So I fluked myself all the way around the the states. Um, however, once people did get get wise to what was happening, that it really was a phenomena, um, I, I've never had been able to distribute the film foreign, for example. Um, so it did very well. I always compare it to the analogy, if you go into a pool hall and um, you pretend that you can't play and finally somebody's going to offer a game to do a game with you, and you keep losing, and you bet a little and little. When the stakes get high, really high enough, and then you run the table, um, you you take the money, but you can't go back into that pool hall. I, I ran the table on Hollywood, and so uh, for a while there, I think most of my enemies now are dead, but um, um, I was person non gratis. The question is, um, my my involvement with the the black exploitation movies that followed. Well, what happened was very simply when Sweetback came out, the Black Panther Party made it compulsory viewing for all of their for all of their members because they said it showed the trajectory of a brother on the outside who went from the individual mentality of where you get this wee shit to someone by halfway through the movie who had evolved to understand from part of being part of the problem to part of the solution when he says, take him, um, he's our future. What Hollywood did, and hats off, they, they were fond of 
the money with a black hero could mean. However, they were not too pleased about the political implications. So what they did simply was they took out the, po the political implications and they inserted a counter-revolutionary aspect, that is, the, the forces of, of honor and right were subtly, sometimes subliminally and not so subliminally, the status quo. So it was always a detective or a narc agent at, for a while. And so once again, they had managed to flip the script a little bit. And that became black exploitation. However, what did happen, because I had steeped the movie so deep in the urban ethos until it raised the bar and they had to begin to hire minorities to write the scripts, to do the dialogue, to make the costumes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there, that way, many people got to into the unions, and that's how the union began to, to break down. So, I mean, I've been traveling around the country, Mario and I, recently, and I go into a studio and I, they think nothing of seeing a woman behind the camera or, or black um, running the, the production aspects of it. These, these things didn't happen before. If you saw a minority, um, he was pushing the broom. If you saw a woman, she was bringing a cup of coffee. That changed a lot of things. The question was, uh, in addition to the Black Panther Party making uh, sweet facts, uh, compulsory the viewing, did you have any interaction or conversations with Huey P. Newton or Eldridge Cleaver or, or any of the other top people in the, the Panther Party at the time? Um, the Panther dedicated an entire newspaper issue to it, and, and Huey P. Newton did a uh, political analysis of the film. I had never met him at that time. I had done a couple of concerts here and um, and always raised monies for the Panthers, but I didn't know them personally. We did find him meet, but we talked about Nookie instead of business. <laughs> <laughs> really, I guess you're asking, what was my, my film education? Yeah. Um, I had none. <laughs> I used to drive, I used to be a gripman in San Francisco. I used to drive cable cars, and I had an idea about writing an article, and that article grew into a book, and that book about the life in the day of a cable car driver. And um, I put photos in it, and I put photos in this little book, sort of a photo essay. And I was selling it, and the book got rather popular. And um, a guy got on my cable car one day, and he said, you know, this is a nice book. It's almost like a movie. I said, shit, I'll go into movies. So that's how I went into movies. Well, what happened was I called a guy who I heard had a camera. I said, hey, I want to make a movie. And the guy said, oh, that's great. We have a documentary about what? I said, no, no, I wanted to have stories. He said, oh, okay. I said, well, how long is a movie? And he says, well, I've been going to triple features and everything. He says, it's um, about it's 90 minutes, hour and a half, maybe five or ten minutes longer. And he says, do you want to shoot in 16 or 35? I said, uh, what's that? <laughs> and he said, oh, 16 or 35 millimeter. I said, oh, okay, what's that? <laughs> hmm? that, was, uh, that was the level that I was, I didn't even know what millimeter meant. And so a guy said, I have a 16 millimeter camera, and you think about it. He says, 35 is more professional, but 16 can, can do it, but it's, and it's a little cheaper. So then I asked him how much. And I made a calculation, this was 1957, that you could make a feature film by my calculations for $500. So, hey, so I, I go, I, what I now learn is called pre-production and location scouting. I, I just use what he called common sense. Well, I got to shoot somebody where we're going to shoot. And I found the places and I got the, the, the people out there. And I said, okay, and I'd seen the movies, and I said, action. And the guy says, um, the guy comes out with a, with a clapboard. He said, well, this, this, this. I said, well, well, what are you doing? Hmm? He said, well, you, you, you got to keep the scenes in line so we'll know what take it is. What take? And my, then after the first day shooting, the guy says to me, he says, well, now we get, you got to send it to the lab and get it developed. Oh shit, I forgot that. 
Hmm? I forgot developing. Oh, I didn't know. I mean, I just in my my enthusiasm, I'd forgotten what the five hundred dollars was the cost of ninety minutes of sixteen millimeter film. Real, real. I mean, I didn't know all these other things. So my first feature turned out to be eleven minutes long. <laughs> hmm? And um, when I first showed it on the wall to myself, I said, well, the story's in there. The guy said, we haven't edited yet. I said, what's that? And a guy gave me a book called um, Film, Form, and Sense by Eisenstein. And he gave me some nail polish and showed me how to cut this stuff. And that, that was my formal film education. We are so fortunate to have you here tonight and to have your body of work. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank Mario. Uh, when uh, you speak to him uh, for... I'm sorry the, the, the boy couldn't make it tonight. We just we, we had a, a conflict of, of, of schedule, etc. But for Mario and for myself and everything, it's, man, it's, it's, it's great to be here. And thank you very, very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Malcolm Van Peebles, thanks for all for joining us.